My mother never told me the stories. All I ever knew were the pictures. In 2011, on the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rides, I returned to Mississippi with my mother. It was there, and in subsequent interviews, that her entire story would begin to unfold. Her great-grandparents were Georgia slave owners, but after the war, the family was reduced to sharecropping and chicken thieving. Her mother moved to Washington, D.C. and married the only foreigner in the family, a Yankee. In 1941, my mother was born. But when her mother suddenly became ill, she was raised by a black woman for the first couple of months of her life. I tell you this because her mother didn't like black people, and her family, like most whites in the South at that time, believed that no matter how bad things might be, at least you weren't black. In the 40s, uh, in these German-occupied uh, countries, if a Jew walking on the sidewalk did not get off the sidewalk when a German was coming and doff, take his cap off, he was risking his life. So we had that same thing over here. I always wondered why I had to go through the back door of the public library, why I could not go into the stacks to get my own books. Um, why I had to go to the colored water fountain. Um, in Sears, I can remember white ladies and colored women bathrooms. Uh, you had you could not sit at Cress's uh, counters. We used to go downtown and to buy candy or something. We couldn't sit at the counter. We couldn't even even uh, go downtown and eat in a lot of the restaurants uh, downtown in D.C. They said we were supposedly equals. We were being treated that way, and I suddenly pissed off this white person. They had all kinds of things at their disposal to take to, to do me in, and there was nothing I could do about it. He said, um, you ran that light. My dad said, no, sir, I didn't run the light. It was yellow. Morris, I said to you, you ran that light. My dad didn't say anything. And he looked at us in the back seat, and I guess we looked like a nice little family. And he said, um, Morris, you like a good nigger. So I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you off this time. Uh, it was a uh, separate and unequal society, uh, basically buttressed by uh, local customs and laws. But you know that was that was just the way things were. And you want to go? What do you mean? That's the way things were. I met whites all over who had questions raised. I later met blacks who, when they had questions raised, their parents had to tell them. Uh, it may be wrong, but don't you try to do anything about it. This is in God's hands. Um, here's how you protect yourself. Maybe you shouldn't ride the bus so much if that upsets you. Your parents did that, but they also told you that it would come to an end because it was wrong. Anything that's that wrong can't last. My mother accepted segregation as the way things were, but one summer, while visiting her family in Georgia. Her life would change forever. But one day this girl, Mary, I think her name was, that, that lived down the road, she and I would, would play together every summer and we decided to sort of dare to each other to go walk through Niggertown, which was down by the Coca-Cola bottling plant and a road led off on the other side of the tracks. It went through the black area and everybody just sort of seemed to disappear into their houses or the back of their houses when these two little white girls were walking through. No one spoke to us, no one bothered us. They just made themselves invisible. I think that's when things really hit me as to how unequal they were and how unfair. I went to church regularly in Sunday school and we memorized all these verses about do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me, all that good King James. And the Sunday school would sing about um, Jesus loves the little children, all the children in the world, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus 
loves the little children of the world. And uh, I guess I've always taken things more or less literally, which sometimes has gotten me into trouble. But uh, sometimes I think it's really worked to my advantage of seeing things clearly. Joan was very aware that she was a Southerner and she knew what that meant. And she loved the South. She loved being a Southerner. Uh, however, when, she, when her eyes were open to what it meant to be a Southerner in this day and age, in the 1950s, to recognize the, the huge divide in, in uh, economic status between the two races, uh, she began to really wonder, how am I, as an individual, going to change this? And I know it's, it's somewhat uh, alarming, really, to think that a nine or a 10-year-old could begin to think that way, but that is exactly where her mind began to go. She didn't like what she saw. She realized it needed to be changed, and she realized somebody had to do it. Uh, she went home and started questioning a lot of things that her mother took for granted, and it began to open up a divide, actually, between mother and daughter. In 1957, National Guard troops were used in Little Rock, Arkansas to enforce the Brown versus Board of Education ruling of 54. And my mother was shocked. This wasn't supposed to happen in America. Segregation had to end. And my mother vowed that if she ever had the opportunity to do something about it, she would do it. In 1960, she would get that opportunity. But the consequences of her decision would both haunt her and define her for the rest of her life. My mother, being from this segregated environment um, in the South, was a segregationist. Not vicious or mean about it, but that was what she considered a normal and appropriate way of life. And it got to the point of when I was going to start applying to colleges, I wanted to go to a small church school. Uh, I think it was in Ohio, but it might have been Kentucky out that way, um, and my mother was absolutely against it. Um, her first objection was that it was, you know, it wasn't well known. It, it was an, you know, not an important college. Um, and the second, and probably her real objection was that she was afraid it would be integrated and I might be in classes and even have a roommate who was colored, as the polite term was then. Uh, so she decided I should go to Duke University. And I just sort of gave up, and at least it'll get me out of the house. And was accepted at Duke. And darned if the sit-ins didn't start. Um, in, in February of my freshman year, and by spring, um, I was involved in the sit-ins. When Joan began to not only participate in meetings where these things were discussed, but what actually went down uh, to the Raleigh-Durham uh, uh, city and began to actually sit in with uh, the black students, uh, she was not only branded as a radical, they thought she was out of her mind. A Southern white woman doing this kind of thing, the only explanation was that she was mentally ill. And she was taken into uh, for uh, some oversight. They talked to her quite a bit uh, after her first arrest. Um, they insisted that she call her parents and let them know what was going on and uh, she was certainly taken to task by the Duke uh, administrators uh, about what she was doing. I knew that what I was doing was in keeping with my understanding of Christianity and the foundation of the country with the Declaration of Independence. But at the same time, I knew it was against the way of life that virtually all the relatives I knew believed in and that you know, the sentiment, the only thing worse than a nigger is a nigger lover, um, would apply, that I would be out of the family. But there was the advantage that once you took the fatal step of stepping outside the bounds of acceptability, there was no stepping back, so you could only go forward. 
and that I think that helped some of us white Southerners to just keep, keep on keeping on. We had no place to go back to. But the movement became family. And black kids sometimes could not go back home either because not that their parents disowned them, but because it was not safe. They were asked not to come back. They knew they could be killed. They knew their parents could be killed or their home burned down or you know one thing and the next. So for a lot of us, there was no turning back. So uh, she immediately comes back to Northern Virginia and gets involved in the student movement up here, which had become very active since February. Um, she moved into an area near Howard University and uh, got involved with a, a group there called NAG, the Nonviolent Action Group. And their, uh, their motto was nag, nag, nag. And they were gonna nag the country into um, submission. And so a lot of the, uh, even in Northern Virginia, a lot of the lunch counters were not yet integrated. So Joan began sitting in with her friends from NAG uh, in, uh, in, in almost like her neighborhood. And it was interesting because there was one sit-in that almost duplicated the Jackson sit-in. The first time I recall meeting Joan was at the, um the drug fair lunch counter over in Arlington. Um, we were surrounded. I think she was sitting next to me. I think you may have seen the picture of Joan sitting right next to me um, with a little kid who, honestly, I, I, he, could, he couldn't have been more than 13 or 14 years of age. But he's in my face with his finger pointing directly in my face. I think most of the focus was actually on the black students. But they would be telling you how God, you know, th things were not meant to be this way, that blacks were inferior, you know, smelly, diseased. I don't know exactly what they said at this point, but this is the general line um, that, that white people should rule. If he were indeed as dedicated as we were, you know, I expected, <laughs> you know, to be hit. There was quite a crowd gathered outside. Well, they emptied the store, and there was also people that had gathered outside that I guess they hadn't let in. And But the police gave a safe passage through that, as I recollect, to some cars that were brought up. And I understand there was some gunfire that evening, of whether it was aimed at someone or into the air or, you know, intimidating. I don't know what happened with that. There was a mob outside, but, but we piled it into an automobile and, and tore out of there. I mean, no one attacked us. And I think that's only because of the fact that there were still police there, and as long as they kept the peace, you know, we were, were safe. Within a couple of weeks, the drug stores in Northern Virginia desegregated, and my mother and her companions began looking for their next target. They settled on Glen Oco Park in Maryland with its segregated swimming pools and amusement rides. My mother purchased the tickets as her fellow black students rushed to get a seat on the merry-go-round. Because, as she would later say, there's the back of a bus and a back of a line, but there's not a back of a carousel. In all, my mother would participate in nearly three dozen sit-ins and protests before a seemingly peaceful plan was hatched to confront interstate travel. It would be called the Freedom Rides. This was an idea that caught the imagination of the country. However, the civil rights community thought it was a bit of a, a lark. Um, they thought, oh, right, we're, you know, we're just going to ride on buses through the South you know, for a couple of months. Um, it was almost seen as like a vacation. And some of the people who actually participated initially were viewed as you know, people who were just you know, slackers. They didn't want to do the hard work of going and demonstrating in front of you know, a hardcore uh, places, so they were just going to take a bus. I think we knew from the start it could be dangerous. On the other hand, maybe to break the tension, maybe half thinking it. Uh, we were teasing Hank and some that, you know, hey, you're going off on this all expense paid vacation. Good way to end the semester, buddy. How I spent my summer in 1961. Let me tell you the ways. <laughs> They put together a small group of 13 riders, I think it was 13, 
who left Washington on two separate buses making their way through the Upper South. In the Upper South, they were attacked a few times. A couple of people were beaten up, arrested, uh, most notably in Rock Hill, South Carolina. But really all hell broke loose when they got to Alabama. And all of a sudden, it made national news and everybody realized this was not just a walk in the park. This was the next stage of the revolution. I had already had a taste. I had seen the violence. I just barely escaped the Klan. So I had no illusions whatsoever about what was going to happen next. I didn't know anything about Anderson, Alabama, and then we were told that we are literally going into the belly of the beast. Uh, Anniston was a hotbed of Klan activity. And as a matter of fact, uh, Jim Farmer, who was a pretty good stump speaker, uh, spoke that night and told a joke about Anderson in terms of foretelling what we were going to be in for it. He said, there was this bus driver driving a Greyhound bus, and as he got maybe three or four miles from Anniston, he heard this knock-knock thumping on the side of the bus, so he pulled over to see what it was, and as he opened the door, the Greyhound had gotten down off of the side of the bus and wanted to come inside. And so he asked and says, why do you want to do that? He said, we getting ready to go into Anniston. <laughs> and there are variations of that joke of, he said, one preacher said, Lord, we're getting ready to go down to Alabama and we want you to be with us. And then it was silence. And uh, he said, Lord, did you hear me? I want you to be with us. So he heard that voice. I'll go with you, as far as Anderson. <laughs> so all kinds of joke about how dangerous it was going to be. And surely enough, when we got maybe a few miles outside of Anderson, we would all had been singing um, on the bus, and as we did that from time to time. A bus coming from Anderson stopped on the opposite side of the highway, and the two bus drivers got out and spoke. And the driver of our bus got back on and looked, kind of looked at us and just kind of smiled. Um, and uh, as we got into Anniston, the streets were deserted. No one. And it was telling us, this is not good. A mob firebombed the bus as churchgoers brought their children to watch the Freedom Riders burn alive on Mother's Day. Riders were able to escape only to be beaten with baseball bats until the local authorities finally stepped in. Freedom Riders were attacked two more times in Birmingham and Montgomery, where it appeared things would come to an end. But a call back to my mother in D.C. to send more riders, and a team led by Diane Nash in Nashville, re-energized everyone. However, my mother and the Freedom Riders were now entering Mississippi, a place many would call the Heart of Darkness. Joan went on an unusual freedom ride. She and a group from Washington, which included uh, the, the activist and later SNCC uh, chairman, uh, Stokely Carmichael, flew from Washington to New Orleans, which is where the freedom rides were supposed to end. And from New Orleans, they took a train to Jackson and therefore integrated yet another um, facility, not the bus depot, but the train depot. You stepped off the bus or out of the train, and you were, went into the waiting room and together, and whether it was the black one or the white one, and told to move on and move out uh, by Captain Ray. Did you all hear me? You're going to do it? You're under arrest. And out to the paddy wagon, and from there to the city jail, and then then you had your trial, so-called, which was also down to absolute routine, and over to the county jail. I got started on my project, A Breach of Peace, because of the mugshots. They're a very remarkable collection of, of documents of this really uh, in the heat of the battle, if you will, of the Freedom Rides. And, um, and all of them, you know, as a set are tremendous. And some of them really leap out at you and Jones is one of those. Joan was somebody I, I interviewed and photographed very late in my process of, of going around the country and seeing people. Uh, but I was very excited to get to her and meet this 
very striking young woman who I came to find out had a very extensive career in the movement both before and after the riots. The way I've come to think about it is, um, uh, you know, they, they knew they were bearing witness to uh, what was going on in Mississippi and in the South. And part of that was being present, you know, while their mugshot was being made. And I think there's a real uh, an quality to, you know, her picture, uh, her portrait, if you will, um, that really kind of leaps off the page. The great thing that the mugshots afford us is not to see Joan today um, as someone who, who did so much and was engaged in so many different facets of the movement, uh, but to see her then and to really think about her as a, as a very young woman who was in the front lines and putting her life at risk. I think that mugshot really kicks all that up in people and gives, us the, gives them the chance that I, you know, that I see people respond to, uh, to really think about what would I do in that situation? Would I have the courage of my convictions? In jail, Joan was segregated from the rest of the, uh, initially from the rest of the black girls. Um, she was put in a, a cell with uh, some of the white women who had begun to participate in the Freedom Rides. I had more in common, culturally, historically, in many ways, with the black girls who were in the cell next to us, who came out of the Southern uh, student movement, than I did with the whites in my cell who were basically all from the North and had most been involved in, oh, how awful those Southerners are and sympathy pickets in the North at, say, a Woolworth or something. They had been involved in Northern political labor and political issues and looked down on the South. She felt that she had more of a dialogue and a, and a commonality with the black girls from the Southern region than these kind of godless um, Northerners who, you know, with their strange accents and their strange uh, practices. So, but she was put in a cell, a, a very small cell with a bunch of girls. It was, a, it was not a very pleasant environment. Um, she wrote a diary at that time and it is a diary that continues to exist. There was a lot of concern of shakedowns, which are always rumored to be going to happen. So I had on this, this skirt that had a big, roughly deep hem. We opened that up a little bit, and I would take the diary, this is it, and just sort of crinkle it up and get it really soft, and then we could open it up and fold it neatly, and then slip it in my hem. And we figured that way it, it probably would not get discovered, and even in a good pat down. My mother would spend two more weeks in Hines County Jail as more and more Freedom Riders flooded the state from all over the country. But Mississippi had a plan to break the Freedom Rides and end the Civil Rights Movement once and for all. And so at 19 years old, my mother and her friends were sent to the most dreaded prison in America, Parchman. Probably one of the most violent and uh, worst places a human being could be. It was a very brutal place. Um, people kind of went there and, and you know, disappeared, uh, some of them. Uh, or the ones that I saw that got out of there and came back were just broken people. So my thinking when they put the Freedom Riders was, oh my God, you know, what, what are these people in for? Parchman was absolutely notorious. Um, we wanted to believe we were coming out of this alive and in one piece, but it was the place of legends for brutality. And the men apparently had it a lot rougher than the women did, but at the time, you had no idea what was happening to anybody else. I got mine whooped a couple of times. <laughs> Wouldn't say, didn't know how to say yasa. <laughs> and, um, and those prison guards were at the lowest rung in uh, white society. They didn't make any money, they just barely, barely made enough to get by. But when they were inside Parchman Prison, uh, they, were, they were kings. Okay, so you could pay him 
$45 a week and all of the blacks he can whoop up on. And somehow or another, he was satisfied. A lot of the writers told me that the, the most scared they were in Mississippi, uh, including getting arrested and the whole thing, was the drive from Jackson to Parchment. And that's when they knew they were alone. Joan was not sure where they were taking her. They were not told where they were going. Uh, they were being put into paddy wagons and just taken off. Uh, and they were taken off into rural parts of Mississippi. And this was before interstates, and none of us really had a good, strong fix on quite where Parchman was, except it was in the Delta, and it was bad. And um, How bad? The worst place in the country. Emmett Till had been murdered not too far from there. We had turned off the main highway or route to, to Parchman, obviously, in going back on to this house sort of back off the road. And the guy has his, um, the driver's buddies are out there and he's sort of showing us off to them and okay, what are they going to do? And um, in hindsight, they were probably trying to intimidate us make us think they were going to do more than they were, and the guy probably needed a pit stop. But um, we didn't know what was going to happen. We could have been killed. That was, it crossed our mind that we might well be killed. So they were taken to Parchman, and uh, Joan tells the story of her first introduction to Parchman, which was uh, not uh, the, the, the nice uh, Hines County Jail where she was allowed to have her own clothes. This is just women, pretty much strip. And um, there's a matron there who's given sort of a rough vaginal exam, uh, cleansing her gloved hand between uh, customers, as it were, uh, in a bucket of what smells like Lysol. Still don't go for that smell. Um, and we were issued um, the coarse denim black and white striped skirts and I think t-shirts. They cleared out death row in the Parchment Penitentiary so that they could make room for these hundreds of uh, students who were coming in. I didn't realize that we were on death row until after I had left. <clears throat> when we went back to Parchment, and the warden was able to take me, young warden at that time, who was not even born uh, at the time of the Freedom Ride, took me to the cell where I was held. And that cell, and I walked it off, was 50 feet from the death chamber. And I'm looking there at that gas chamber. And then I turn around and walk back to my cell, and then I had to walk back again to that gas chamber. That's where I was. That's where we were. As far as the state of Mississippi was concerned, we had committed capital crimes. I definitely wanted to go back to Parchman. Um, I'm not totally sure why, but it had been an, an important two months of my life shared so much there with so many. And whatever ghosts were lingering in the back of my persona, I thought this would set them free. I wasn't really at all sure how I would feel when I got there. And I think a lot of us were that way. We wanted to go, but ooh, <laughs> can we handle it? But the reception we got there from the head of the prison on down. It was good. Welcome home. Yeah, that's right. Welcome home. Hey, uh, we're together. Come on. Once a week. Tell them this looks right for 
familiar. Far too many of you crying. So I guess this must have been who we met with the rabbi. Brother, brother, brother. Is that mom? This far too many. This little area right here must have been who we met with the rabbi. Oh yeah, here's 14. Home sweet home. Yeah, we had bunk beds back then. I don't think we had a storage area. Actually, when there were three people in the cell, we put another mattress underneath and then pulled it out um, at night. And definitely not a water fountain, but a sink and a commode. To see the cell was as small as I remembered it, that, um, you know, not comparable to the Nelson Mandela's experience, but a cell that was smaller than the one he was in for years, we had up to four people in. And that, that did put it, in a, you know, that, that part of it in perspective. Um, but then some of us who'd been sort of nervous, we were in no hurry to leave. We were, when we were there, we were sort of, even though we were on the same cell block, we were isolated from each other. You just heard voices. You never really had a chance to face-in-face -and -face encounter when you went for showers or something. You were hurried right down that cell block. And to be there reminiscing. Oh, you were down there. Remember when this happened? They, they did feed us fried chicken on the 4th of July and just laughing and feeling sort of like a reunion in a, in a unique sort of way. It, that was good. Yeah, it just seems funny walking out the door, and some of us, particularly a couple of us, seem sort of reluctant to be leaving. We want to take in more of it. Um, that was the most dreaded prison in America, and terrified as many of us were to come here. Now we can't get enough of it on our one trip back. It was good to come away with that. We were had to be sort of, the buses have got to leave, you know. Come on, folks. <laughs> then we'd find something else to compare notes on. So glad we did it. Refusing bail, my mother would finish her two months on death row. And upon her release, set off for Tougaloo College, where she had been accepted as the first white student to enroll in the school's storied history, and where she would later become a member of Delta Sigma Theta. I'm sitting here looking around the campus. Feels right at home. The chapel, my old dormitories at either end are still standing. I know where I am. The housing that was really close to County Line Road on that side of the housing, people had metal plates to deflect bullets um, that might come in. Every now and again, particularly when things like Meredith was going into Old Miss, or Kennedy was assassinated, Any, anything that got feelings running high. Folks would drive down that road and fire into the houses. Was there a lot of crosses on campus? Um, not a lot, but at night the Klan was subject to coming campus down past the president's house. It was a lot more wooded then than it is now. and. Um, some of the guys would be down there waiting for intruders, but with their hunting, they didn't have their hunting rifles down there, I understand. But occasionally there'd be a cross burning down there, but they'd try to chase them off. This is so scenic. Is that the type of branch that hangs on? Yeah, not high enough to be inconvenient, but um, good and sturdy and high enough that someone's feet wouldn't touch the ground. You've never seen that before. I've never seen a hanging, but... You almost were one. Well, life has its hazards. I'm standing on the path that I walked down with Dr. King after he spoke here to take him over to the science building where he was speaking to a crowd. I can't really tell you exactly what Dr. King said, but as always, it was inspirational and helped to give us the strength 
press on until victory was won. In many ways, King was our hero, like he was for most of the civil rights movement. The leader, the spokesperson, the inspiring voice. But at other times, we students were totally frustrated with him that he was too busy preaching and not leading enough action. It was a delicate balance. Joan was considered uh, the segregationist's worst nightmare. The whole concept that somehow, you know, something could happen between this white uh, woman and these black men on campus was a big concern of the authorities in Mississippi. And in fact, it was an attempt to shut down Tougaloo as a result of this reverse integration that was going on. And fortunately for Tougaloo, their charter predated the Jim Crow laws uh, from the late 1800s, and so they were able to kind of skirt by that. But there were certainly many people in Mississippi that were uncomfortable and unhappy with Joan's presence on Tougaloo. She wasn't the outside agitator. She was a white Southerner. She was a white Southern woman. And so for that purpose, she was even more dangerous to the white supremacist power structure because she was one of their own. She was one of their own who grew up to see that the system was wrong and she rejected it and she actively opposed it. And not only that, in, in addition, it probably shouldn't be underestimated the fact that she was a woman. And of course, white supremacy for hundred, for at least a hundred years had used white women as an excuse for the violence that they enacted upon black men. So here's this white woman who is supposed to be protected by white supremacy, who is supposed to be, uh, be the one that Jim Crow keeps these um, black beast rapists and these, these people, uh, Jim Crow is meant to protect her. Here's this white Southern woman who's supposed to be protected by the system saying, I don't need this protection and I don't believe in the system. And so that made her incredibly dangerous, a huge threat to that power structure. This is one of the many letters I got after I enrolled at Tougaloo, dated November 14, 1961. My dear Joan Trumpower, you dear pitiful child, can't you and the rest of the young generation see what the communists are doing? This isn't the doings of the true-blooded Americans. It is the Jews and communists behind all of this Negro business. It's true that God made us all humans, black and white, but he didn't intend us to mix. Now here's a card, don't know who it's from. Looks like that was a postcard. Race mixing is a dumb, stupid, unnatural action. Even the animals, birds, and fish know better than to mix. Race mixing is an outrageous action and will result in mongrelization, degradation, and destruction of white Christian America and civilization. Race mixing is a subversive device of the communist plot to destroy white America and Christianity. If you preach, teach, or advocate race mixing, you are promoting the communist line and the religion of the devil. Well, this fan mail was sort of expected. We'd heard it all before. Um, sometimes it was sad and sometimes it was amusing. Uh, this person from Troy, New York. Integration equals communist. We love Governor Barnett. And another one, handwritten. Dear Miss Trump Power, why do you throw away your silly life on blacks at all? It seems to me you should go to your own people and help them mount, help them maintain what God has pur purposely made manifest, segregation. Or they can spell, but their handwriting could use a few lessons. From Los Angeles, Dear Ms. Trumpower, I have read the article Reverse Integration in Mississippi several times, and each time I read the article, I'm forced to believe there is a living Christ or rather a living concept of Christianity. This symbol of the living Christ is you. I do not believe there is to be found anywhere a more dedicated individual than you have shown in the last few years of your activity. 
your participation in core, and now a student at Tougaloo College are all traits of your belief in Christian principles. So how was that when you received it? Wow, that sort of makes it all, all worth it that I'm, people understand what I'm doing and appreciate it. Um, a little over the top in the praise, comparing me as a living Christ, but at least seeing the connection between Christianity and what I'm, the way I'm trying to live. That's good, <laughs> finally. By the end of her first year at Tougaloo, Joan was accepted on campus. She was getting to become part of the fabric of the, of the campus life. Um, she leaves and goes back home uh, her parents had uh, attempted to reconcile with her and frankly were dangling a European vacation in front of her as a way of getting her away from the South. And hopefully, once they got her out of the South, hopefully they would you know, keep her out of the South. So she accepted this, uh, this little junket uh, uh, off to Europe for that summer and apparently had a grand time. But when it was time to go back to school, she went right back to Tougaloo in the fall of 1962. And interestingly, right at that point, there was a new movement developing. Uh, John Salter, uh, one of the professors on campus, uh, had begun working with Medgar Evers, the head of the NAACP, to develop a student movement that would eventually rock the foundations of the city of Jackson and the state of Mississippi. This new movement would explode on May 28, 1963, when John Salter and Megat Evers took the Jackson boycott to the next level. In all, 14 people would participate in what would become one of the most famous and violent sit-ins of the civil rights movement. I've heard at various times from the reporter, the cameraman, and the son of one of the reporters that this was the most terrifying, frightening event they covered in the civil rights movement. Now, I guess they weren't in Birmingham or Montgomery with the Freedom Riders, but they got around, and um, this to them was the worst. Everyone believed that the, the students would be immediately arrested and carted off to jail. And so no one thought that that was gonna cause much of a ruckus. They really had their hopes pinned on the integrated group of demonstrators um, outside the store, down the street. When the three individuals, uh, Perlina Lewis, Memphis Norman, and Ann Moody, sat down at the white counter, nothing happened. The police would not come into the store and arrest the sit-in students because of a Supreme Court decision the week or so before, saying they could not come in of their own initiative, they had to be invited by the store manager. This was a case that uh, grew out of the Durham, North Carolina sit-ins, and my name was one of the ones on the decision. Now Joan, interestingly, was not supposed to be part of this demonstration. She was what was called a spotter. and. She was supposed to spot the uh, demonstration, the protests going on down the street. But the picket line was arrested more or less immediately instead of lasting a while. So Lois and I phoned in a report on that, and um, then they would, Med, uh, Medgar's office would know to get the lawyers and bonds money together. And then it was sort of like, okay, what do we do now? This was a block or so up the street. And um, he said, well, let's go check on what's happening at Woolworth. They had no idea that, that, that this environment had turned uh, volatile until they walked in the store. And it was right at that moment that a, a, a thug, a former police officer, had come in, a, a, you know, racist, virulent segregationist, came in and pulled... Memphis Norman, the one black male off of his stool, knocked him onto the floor and began kicking him mercilessly. Um, Memphis, you know, curled up into a, a ball and was trying to protect himself in the way that he had been taught. And luckily, this 
thug, Benny Oliver was his name, uh, had on just tennis shoes. If he had had on any other type of shoe, Memphis would have been uh, severely hurt. In this case, there was still blood running out of his nose, running out of his ear. Then an undercover policeman um, came up and arrested both of the of the guys, the attacker and Memphis, um, probably breach of peace. When we had seen Memphis kicked in the head, uh, he had blood coming out his nose and ears, which is not a scratch. Uh, anything could have happened to anybody. Meanwhile, I was back at the NAACP offices in the Masonic Temple uh, when a quick hurried call came. Uh, that a mob was gathering in the Woolworth store, uh, that Memphis Norman had been pulled off his stool and savagely kicked, then arrested. Medgar and, and John, others in the office, had to make the decision, do we call it off and try to rescue the last two people who were there? Uh, and then if we didn't call it off, how could we leave just two people at that counter? would we have volunteers to go in? So I set out to head for the Woolworth store. Medgar wanted to come, and I persuaded him not to, because I said, you're a marked man. And the way this thing is developing, you know, you could get killed. John was then stuck in the situation wondering what's going to happen next. Um, Ann Moody had been pulled off of her stool and thrown against some of the counters. Um, Perlina Lewis was also pulled from the stool and was down on uh, was down on her knees right by the counter when the police officer came on the scene. Both of them rushed back to the counter, and so that so that they were so the demonstration would continue. Joan sees all this and realizes, first of all, she is beginning to communicate with the the demonstrator. She's she sees a man with a knife walk by Ann Moody and she calls out, um, Annie, he's got a knife. Um, and all of a sudden she's identified with the people at the counter. <laughs> Who's this white girl talking to those black girls, you know? So all of a sudden she realizes that she's in danger. But then I sat down. That's when I became a problem. She walked through that mob in the war store. And they realized, of course, immediately where she stood. She joins Perlina and Annie at the counter, the first white to join the demonstration. And at this, the crowd is just incensed. They become like hornets. They start screaming at her, you black bitch, you black, you, you white nigger, you, uh, you know, a traitor, um, communist. Yelling, screaming, cursing, laughing, a lot of loud laughter, dirty jokes being cracked, racist remarks. Um, anytime people went to the counter, though, it was like the, the crowd, the mob, really turned into an animal, just an angry roar when they realized someone else was not afraid of them. One of the white guys who was in league with Benny Oliver uh, grabs Joan uh, and pulls her off the stool. Another one grabs Annie Mooney and pulls her off and drags them to the back of the store and out the door. Uh, Joan it's interesting, um, she kept her composure, and once outside of the store, what we see is this white, tough guy pulling on a white Southern girl. And the police arrest the guy and let Joan go back in the store. So he is arrested and carted off, and she's let to go back in the store. Annie is standing right there at the entrance. Somewhere she's lost her shoes, but they're both okay, and they both decide that they're safer if they get back to Perlina and back to the counter, so that's what they do. They, they make their way back through a throng of a couple of hundred people by this point, back to the counter. I went immediately to the lunch counter to sit with Joan and Annie Moody. A white man, mistaking me identity-wise and mission-wise, yelled out, hit him hard, boy, hit him. But then I sat down with them, and the crowd was quiet for just one moment, and then I heard my name mentioned by somebody. And then they moved in on me. When Salter joined, the crowd turned violent. 
he was knocked in the back of his head with uh, brass knuckles. Um, there was a student who put his cigarette out on the back of Salter's neck. There were several cigarettes, and you can still see it to this day. If you look on the back of his neck, he has scars in the shape of a cigarette. Um, they threw pepper and water mixture into his eyes. My guideline was don't let the sons of bitches see you suffer. Meanwhile, I was chain smoking my pell mells if I could, see. I talked to the police outside, there were about 40, 50 police outside the store who were letting whites in. And I talked to them about, you know, what's happening. Why don't you come in and stop it? And they would laugh and say, it's your business, you folks started it. But they certainly knew about all the violence inside. You could see it through the, through the windows. They just got so hostile that this, this, uh, this white man was sitting in. Um, things were just going out of control. And at that point, Joan has said that she believed that they were not going to make it out alive. None of them were going to make it out alive. I think I was beyond fear. I think I was driven by determination to carry this through. And by the time I sat at the counter a while, it was like an out-of-body experience that the real me had left the body, and it was just a shell there. And the real me was sort of up above, like a guardian angel, um, letting me know what was happening and protecting me to some extent. But the real essence of me, the important part, was already out of there. So there we were, and this went on for probably it had started at 11, got violent around 11.30. Uh, we got there before 12, something like that. Uh, it ended around 2.30. Uh, by that time, there were really several hundred people in the Woolworth store, uh, and a great number of them outside. I learned later that a huge crowd outside extended down the sidewalk way around the street corner. Uh, the spotters did observe the FBI doing its normal task when people were threatened with death, very carefully observing. I understand the FBI was there somewhere and the undercover police and the State Sovereignty Commission and you know, Citizens Council, everybody was there in their role, um, recording it, egging it on. So I'd say 90% of the thugs in the store were, were young, but they were the results of what would be years of white citizens' council racial indoctrination, some of it conveyed even by lesson plans, uh, which cooperative teachers introduced into curriculums. The kids were a product of their environment, but they were also the tools of the power structure it was used into accomplish its ends. What eventually happens at the sit-in is that the president of Tougaloo College realizes what's going on, comes down to Woolworths, tries to get the police to enter the store to shut it down. They refuse, tries to get the manager of the store to shut the store. He refuses, finally gets on the phone with the national office uh, of Woolworths and they advised the store manager to shut the store down. So after nearly three hours of this intensity, at a little after two o'clock in the afternoon, the manager comes down, turns out all the lights in the store, and tells everybody to leave. I think the best way to put it is that it was a very interesting afternoon, uh, to put it mildly. But we had no idea of the implications. One immediate implication was that instead of just a few hundred people coming to a mass meeting, uh, there were almost a thousand. And it's the first time that Black Jackson really rises up and says, we're going to support this movement. And it's a major turning point in, in the, the movement in Jackson. The following two weeks turn into a demonstration after demonstration. 
and begin to open up uh, the city of Jackson. It uh, becomes more and more tense situation with the mayor and the city council and the folks who are trying to negotiate on the side of, uh, of the black populace. Um, it ultimately ends, unfortunately, with the assassination of Medgar Evers. Medgar Evers, the head of the NAACP in Mississippi, was shot in the back by Byron De La Beckwith while standing in his driveway. In his hands were fundraiser t-shirts that read, Jim Crow must go. I think Medgar, to me, represents all the people who died uh, gaining freedom. He was one I knew. I could have been killed. He was. Apparently, the Klan had a poster. I've never seen it, but I've talked to people who have. People uh, who are the Klan's most wanted list, like the FBI had the 10 most wanted. And when somebody was killed, their face was X'd out. Mine never got X'd out, and Makers did. I'm here in Washington. I live, what, three miles from Arlington Cemetery. So whenever um, I'm in town on his, the day he, was, he died, I try to get by his grave. A lot of years I haven't made it. A lot of years I have, and increasingly I have. Um, and increasingly I find other people are making it just by the number of flowers and uh, stones that are left at his grave. And I feel like when I go to Medgar's grave, it's sort of like giving thanks to him for his sacrifice. Um, giving a report to him, sort of going. It focuses my thoughts on what went before and what's happening now. I think that's um, why my reaction to his uh, Obama's election was, I've got to go to Medgar's grave. Partly to update things. Um, and reflect on him, and uh, partly to give thanks to Medgar. Through the summer of 1963, my mother stayed in D.C. and focused her energies on helping plan and organize one of the largest human rights rallies in U.S. history, the March on Washington. Up until the march actually took place, till that morning, we were not at all certain it was going to come off. Um, the newspapers had brought up the possibility of riots. Um, store owners downtown boarded up storefronts a bit um, or were anticipating problems. The American Nazi Party was just over across the river in Arlington. Um, a lot of people were against the civil rights movement then. And there was even thought that the federal government might bring out troops and prevent the march from happening, that the buses would be halted um, before they even got to the city. So when we went down to the mall early in the morning and there were buses beginning to appear and everything was peaceful and beautiful, um, it was, that was a good moment. I didn't get to march. I would was working back in the press tent handing out, you know, kits or what have you of, of information to, to the press. And then when it was getting pretty close to time for the speeches, um, they had a van or something that they bust us all up closer so we could hear what was happening. Dr. King had, in his prepared speech, did not have the I Have a Dream the uh, speech that we're all familiar with now, that got added, sort of an inspiration at the end, because I hadn't seen the text of what anybody was going to say. I know John Lewis had to um, censor his a bit and calm it down and make it more appealing to the Kennedys. But um, King went, just went off on the I Have a Dream part. 
It was interesting to me now that it's iconic, and it's it's good. But the Washington Post, in its coverage of the March on Washington, which was the you know banner headline, lead story, pictures on the front page, had a Philip Randolph as the number one speaker. Uh, did not even mention Dr. King until you got to where it was, you know, continued on page whatever. Um, King's Dream, which was not even supposed to be part of the program and not picked up on by the press, uh, is how we remember it. On September 15th, 1963, tragedy would befall the most innocent of victims in the battle for racial equality when a bomb exploded at the 16th Street Baptist Church. We've all seen the footage of the people getting sprayed by the water hoses and, and things like that. Well, that was the, pro the protests that were going on at that time, and they were essentially being staged on the 16th Street Baptist Church because it was a downtown church, and they could gather there and then leave from there for their protest. And that, so that's what was happening. Well, the Klan didn't like that, so what they did is they planted a bomb underneath the steps on the side of that church and it blew up at about 10.22 in the morning. In fact, the, these, these girls were getting ready. There was a youth service that morning. And in fact, the title of the lesson was called The Love That Forgives. And the, and the bomb blew up and killed those four girls. Time for sadness. There was nothing to celebrate. Glass that we picked up out of the gutters at the 16th Street Baptist Church, the day that three of the little girls who had been blown up there were buried. And the police shot over the heads of the people who came out of the church to disperse the mob right I mean, you expected people like Medgar to get killed. You were ready to die yourself. You were out in front doing things. But three girls, four girls in Sunday school, that was just beyond belief, particularly following right after the March on Washington. I took a one piece of glass and glued it onto some black ebony wood and then made a necklace is too nice a word for it, but made something to wear to remember it by. Carried a piece of glass in my wallet for years. Just when I was fishing around for the change, I'd feel that glass. And it was good for my soul. But why those kids in church on Sunday morning? Only people directly connected with the church and the family were allowed in the church where, a different church, where the funeral was held and loudspeakers were trained on the streets, which were just filled with mourners. And Dr. King spoke. Photographer Matt Heron, who had been with the Civil Rights Movement in um, Jackson, was able to hide back of the organ pipes to get pictures um, with permission. But the rest of us were just listening from the outside, and um, they carried the caskets down the, the steps and through the crowd, and it was, people were crying. It was hard to keep it together. American flags were waving. And to me, this was the saddest day of the movement when they buried those kids. We attended the funeral. We were standing outside, and uh, we were going to follow the cortege until uh, Ed King and uh, Diane Nash pointed and showed us the um, National Guard standing with guns aimed down at us in the streets. The, the National Guard, who had been deputy who had been nationalized by the president of the United States had rebel flags on their uniforms. Mm -hmm. And I was holding this American flag, which was not liked. They just fell in love with the American flag recently. 
in the South. And so this Still flag not. was a sign of resistance that I was holding. So you could see them standing all up around with the guns drawn. Where were they, on top of the church? Yeah, all around. I didn't look up, I guess. <clears throat> and so um, Ed and Diane said, look, 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 look. The same way they did at Megas funeral in Jackson when John Doerr came out and started screaming, yelling, said, uh, you must stop because they're going to shoot you, pointing to the guns aimed at people in the streets there on Ferris Street. It would have been like Sharpville Massacre. I'm not sure they were going to shoot us. Oh, uh, we were standing. You're not sure? No. The church, you, you're talking about during the time the funeral was going on? Yes, ma'am. They had just blown the church up, Joyce. Yeah, but... What but makes you think they Martin Luther King you? was inside, so pre preaching he was killed. the funeral. He I'm, was killed. Listen, let me speak, please. Will you indulge me a little? No, there were a lot of people standing in front of that church. And I don't know whether they were going to shoot or not, but if there was any restraint to be had on that day, they would have had it. We bring from these experiences different feelings, impressions, and so on. Well, this is reality I'm dealing with. Well, so I would have been shot too. Yes, ma'am. We'd seen the violence with the murder of Emmett Till, and we'd seen people, segregationists we felt would do whatever they thought it, would, it took to keep their way of life. But within the terms of the movement, this, this was too much. In May of 1964, fate finally caught up with my mother when she came face to face with the Klan and what she would later admit was her most harrowing experience in the movement. We had no doubt we were going to die. Mississippi was known as the deepest of the deep south, the heart of darkness, where lynchings were not considered a crime. We had known all along that somebody was going to die that summer, and it looked like it was us. It was a curfew, and there had been heavy demonstrations over the right to vote earlier in the day at the courthouse, several hundred people marching there, and a lot of people had been beaten. Throughout the day, there had been incidents of whites just attacking blacks walking on the streets. So a very violent atmosphere. Ann Moody, who actually had been part of the camp movement, um, came back to campus because they were all graduating at the same time. Joan and Ann and Memphis were all graduating at the same time. Ann came back and said, there is going to be some real trouble there tonight, and I, I advise you not to go. Canton had been off limits to white civil rights work as it was that bad a town. And. It was Ed King's car, but since he was pretty well known, we had Hamid Kisselbosch, who was from Pakistan, um, swarthy skinned, but would be classified as white. He was driving. I told him to lock his door, um, made sure mine was locked, um, and he didn't lock his door, and I didn't check to make sure. I just assumed he understood. Well, we had only gone, you know, half a block and realized there was a white car waiting to follow us. It's, it, it, was, it was almost like from the time we entered Canton, there was preparation going on because we were followed from the time I was watching my rear view mirror in the car. There was a car following us all the way to the church where the meeting was to be held. Then when we came out, and we're leaving Canton. Again, the car followed us until we were stopped at that intersection. We left after the meeting, um, headed back to the newly opened interstate, and the police were not following us. Um, a dearth of obvious policemen around, which was a little unusual, but we realized another car was following us and Jesus, somebody was got ahead of us and when we got out to sort of that no man's land between the old road and the interstate, um, we got boxed in and forced to stop. 
And then they came back and surrounded us in the car. They did not identify themselves as Klan, but their behavior was Klan-like. Uh, they weren't wearing hoods. They didn't need to if they planned to kill us. The guys came out and pretty much surrounded the car, with crowbars in hand. His Hamid had the window cracked and didn't get it up in time or something. But anyway, they got the car door open and were beating him on the head. And uh, they started uh, sort of banging on the car and trying to open the door of my car where I was. I was uh, not particularly sure what they were up to, so I, in fact, rolled down the window to ask what was the problem or what did they want. And then somebody grabbed me from my shirt and tried to pull me out. And that's the time that uh, I think Joan and Jeanette and Ed and Eli all were trying to tell them that I was a foreigner. A couple days before the leading um, politician in the opposition party in the Indian parliament had been arrested in Jackson going to a restaurant. It had been a deliberate um, move on his part, anticipating arrest, but following in the footsteps of Gandhi in support of um, the blacks in Mississippi. And this had not gone over well at the em embassy in Washington, which had complained to the State Department, which had contacted uh, local police and politician for the forces that be in Mississippi. This was national news. Uh, it was also local television news. They said, this must be the man on TV tonight. And I realized, well, that's an opening. So in good Christian Gandhian fashion, I lied, uh, which Gandhi wouldn't have done. He'd have offered himself, but if that meant three other people in the car were killed, I hope Gandhi would have lied. And so I said, oh yes, this is the man that was on TV that the American government <laughs> got released from the Jackson police. And that got interesting to two men at the window. And the others were saying, what are y'all talking about? And I kept pushing this, that this was the Indian man. And Hamid, even though he was bleeding, was highly insulted. He was from Pakistan. They had only been separated from India for you know, 10 or 12 years, and he kept saying, I'm not an Indian, I'm from Lahore, Pakistan. Lahore, Pakistan. And one of the men said, what is that, Lahore, Pakistan? And I said, it's a big city in India, India, India. Uh, then got into the rational point that they couldn't kill a foreigner. And I said, we know you can kill Americans. That's all right with the, with the FBI and the government. But the government and the FBI won't let you kill a foreigner. That'll hurt our reputation throughout the world. The communists would make a lot out of it. And by this time, they've stopped trying to beat him. They are concerned. They're confused. They begin to say, literally, at the back, let's have a party, let's have a party which meant a lynching party. And others were saying, we've got to do it tonight because this is our way to stop Freedom Summer, you know, to kill a bunch of people in advance. And arguing among themselves, remarks were made, we've got the place, it's nearby, we were ready to do it. Uh, three weeks later, they do it with three Americans. In the back seat, we were just sort of making our peace with the Lord. That was probably the closest to death uh, that I came in the movement. Talking about it later, we all agreed that we were prepared to die and that we felt amazingly calm about it. Uh, I swore with a second lie that I would never return to do movement work in that town. Um, that helped the leaders have an excuse. Well, we got something. Uh, Reverend King's promise never to come back. We'll scare them away. I mean, once I had been hit on the head, there was a little bit of a feeling that they'd gotten something for their trouble. We were able to keep, keep it on to the interstate and stopped at the state highway patrol, which um, 
He said, gee, you got a problem. You got to go back to Canton and report it. I asked Hamid if he could go through one more thing without going to the hospital. And I, I was ready to take the wheel if he passed out. Uh, we went to the governor's mansion. The governor had said there was no violence in the state. And if there was, he wanted to be the first person to know. So I brought Hamid up to the doorstep, dripping blood on the marble steps, and tried to speak to the governor. And when the governor's door people understood who we were, they slammed the door. Then we took Hamid to the emergency room. It just wasn't our time. God wasn't ready to put up with us. Three weeks later, in an attempt to stop Freedom Summer and maintain their way of life. The Klan would succeed in killing three civil rights workers, Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner. From the time they were missing, we knew they were dead. You know, the government had a big search and all this, you know, maybe they're alive. Is In fact, I remember Bob Moses at the Freedom House um, on Rose Street in, in Jackson when we were having early discussions about recruiting students in the North to come down about, he was um, focusing his thought, thoughts on, can we ask these students to come down knowing that somebody is going to die? We can tell them they're going to die, but they really won't understand it, but we know they will. Somebody's going to be dead. And the memorial service for James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner, Sunday, August 9, 1964. Well, I wasn't there. But when, when Mickey Schwerner and his wife Rita had first come down to work in Mississippi, um, the winter, the spring before, they were out at Tougaloo. Everybody with the Civil Rights Movement came through Tougaloo. It was the only place you really felt free in Mississippi. And over, I guess, at Ed King's house, he was the chaplain. And so many people were coming through, we sort of took turns giving them the orientation fell to me to give Mickey and Rita sort of the orientation of what you really need to know as a white person working in civil rights in Mississippi. And I think I did a good job. And I know that nothing that I could have added would have made any difference in what happened. But I, I felt Not really a responsibility, but a, an unusual connection with them. We'd been by um, a SNCC folks en route to Atlanta. We'd stop in Meridian at their offices for a pit stop, and if it was really late, a place to sleep. So we were closer than average. Then for them to be gone, um, could just as easily have been us, but... And actually, beyond that, I was in a car coming back from Canton, deliberately an all-white car. Um, all the passengers were white. Coming back from a mass meeting in Canton, left bef before the curfew went into effect. Turns out later, through some plan informer, uh, that we were supposed to have been killed that night to stop Freedom Summer. And because we weren't killed, our friends were. So thinking about Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman hits home real hard. That's it. Now, sometimes people ask if I had
have any sort of guilt feeling for being alive when three others died because I lived. And no, guilt is not the word. But I think I felt sort of an extra responsibility to do more in the um, justice and racial equality end of things, wherever I was. And I'm not, you know, focused on this all the time, but I think it's sort of at the back of my mind that I've, I've got to do a little extra for them to promote the brotherhood of man and peace. There's nothing I could have said or done that would have made any difference in the way things turned out. I'm, I'm clear on that. And I've other friends that were killed um, or you know, severely damaged in their personality uh, by the movement events. Those of us who are left to keep, keep up the good fight have to do their uh, little extra for them. After four long years, my mother's time in the movement came to an end. She arrived in Mississippi as a student and upon graduating, felt that leaving was the honest, full circle thing to do. Despite her degree and experience, she was hired as a clerk by the Smithsonian at a lower level than when she worked for the government in high school. They don't hire women, she was told, because all they do is get married, have babies, and quit. My mother quietly slipped back into society, became a teacher's aide in Arlington, Virginia, and raised five boys as a single mother. While she doesn't make a big fuss of what she did herself, she understands its importance to others. But, as she would tell you, she did it because it was the right thing to do. She saw something wrong, and she was determined to do her part. And I don't think you'll find many more people who were as dedicated and committed to the call to the cause of righting a wrong uh, than Joni. Joan could have just glided through life like the rest of them. She could have felt something but didn't do anything. She could have gone out and married well and got the right husband and all that stuff. She could have done all of that. She said, there's a wrong that needs fixing. I'm gonna go fix it. That's courage, you know, that's having conviction, that's following through on it. I, I, I applaud that. She is, uh, in my mind, one of those sheroes uh, that demands uh, respect and acknowledgement. Clearly, uh, she was a lady ahead of her time. It became a spiritual mission for her to uh, to bring about change in a way that everybody could live with and so that everyone in the society could have a better life. And she put her life on the line recognizing that she may not be able to enjoy the benefits of that society, perhaps, um, but recognizing also that unless she took a stand, uh, future generations would have to suffer through as well. I think that's really, for me, the heart of Joan's story. Are you ordinary? I'm about as ordinary as they come. Are you a hero? I wouldn't see myself as a hero. What do you see yourself as? I see myself as a southerner. I see myself as a mom. I see myself as a teacher. I see myself as a friend. And on a good day, I see myself as a person who has something to share with others. It's not just one person that does it all. It's not just Dr. King. It's not just Rosa Parks. It's not just Harriet Tubman, the way it's taught in school. Um, but that it's lots of people that you've never heard of 
doing what's right, going beyond themselves and out of their comfort zone, making hard choices that causes change. I saw something was wrong and wanted to try to help make it right. We have to pick our targets. And mine was the Southern way of life. I don't know why my mother never told me the stories. But when I began asking others if she ever told them, I realized I wasn't alone. And so I decided to ask my mother how it is that she could have helped change countless lives and yet seemingly keep it a secret from the rest of us. Perhaps the memories were ones she wanted to forget, or, or maybe she didn't feel that what she did was all that special. But her reason was much simpler than that. And while it probably shouldn't have surprised me, it did. She simply said, you never asked. This morning when my man was sad. Where the 